The first talk is from David Strutt, Haematology Technical Manager at Torbay Hospital, South Devon, and he's going to talk about a novel haemoglobin variant. Torbay was the first site in the Europe and therefore the world to have our full Hariba Hilo system installed. So I'd like to hand over to David Strutt now. Thank you very much. Hi, yeah, I'm David Strutt. Um, right, okay, uh, we're going to talk about um, the incidental findings of uh, haemoglobin variants from the increased um, A1C testing that biochemistry have been doing over the last few years. So it's a retrospective study, which is, um, and uh, data was collected under the predefined inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria. All the samples that, that uh, uh, requested HPLC testing between the start of 2015 and 2016 were obtained. Any samples from this data that had A1C testing and a referral to the haematology lab after, abnormal, after an abnormal chromatogram were included in the study. Samples that did not have A1C testing basically included either antenatal samples or samples that had been previously tested. And, refer, and we, we do referrals from other hospitals and they were also excluded as well. Next slide, please. So over, over the examination period, um, chemistry, biochemistry did a total of 168,219 A1C tests. Um, and, um, and it's an increase in 7.8% um, from um, over the two years. From these tests, 131 patients were referred to the haematology lab, which I guess in the sheer numbers isn't that great a deal. Um, but they were referred to us because that's our protocol is that chemistry refer them to us and we do the HP, HPLC testing. Um, so 105 of these patients were discovered to have a variant um, which we, we did HPLC and confirmation tests with uh, acid and alkaline gel. And of the total number of variants, um, 20 out of 105 were clin clinically significant, mainly um, heterozygous. But, uh, so if we have the overview here, um, and you see the majority are A, um, ADs and AGs, um, which our techniques can't uh, uh, actually I differentiate between either. However, we can have a good idea dip, um, on whether it's an AD or a G from the actual variant presence. We're currently now using capillary electrophoresis, which gives us a, a greater idea of whether it's an alpha variant and therefore a G or a beta variant, a D. Um, we've got 14% um, of haemoglobin S's uh, as well, AS's. And I'm sure some of them may be visitors to the area or moved into the area, may, may already have been known. But as I say, they, they, these are all the incidental findings from um, our chemistry colleagues passing them over to us. Um, and as you see on the right hand side, we've got uh, no evidence. And it's basically because we found no evidence. However, I, I guess if we'd have sent them off, um, because chemistry have actually found the um, evidence of a variant, we'd have probably found variants that were running with hemoglobin A or, or, um, or, or were silent by the techniques. Um, so we had um, one hemoglobin sensitive, which 1% hemoglobin sensitive, which is quite an interesting one, and, um, and another one, hemoglobin torbay. Next slide, please. Right, so this is just a, a tabu um, tabular breakdown of uh, over the two years. And fair, it's fairly consistent over the two years uh, of what we were picking up. Um, and this is um, two haemoglobin SC diseases. Again, they may have been visitors to the, to the area because it's unlikely they'd have got through life without actually being detected somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Right, so this is um, a variant that we were pushed through. If you could you go to the next slide and we'll go back to this one, please. Right, this is the uh, chromatogram that um, biochemistry um, uh, sent us, uh, sent with a sample. 
and they obviously picked up a variant there. So if we go to the, um, the previous slide again, and we can see from the uh, beta thal column on the TOZO G8 that there's the hemoglobin, hemoglobin A peak there and a peak running around where the hemoglobin S uh, runs. Um, the peak itself has got a bit of a shoulder and isn't a classic S peak, but nonetheless, we did a sickle screen and that, that came up to be negative. So we did some further tests. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next one, please. Uh, so we did acid and alkaline electrophoresis. And on the face of it, um, on the alkaline geo, we, it looks like it's um, running with the S. However, um, if you look closely, it's not quite with the S. It's actually running between the F and S on the, on the alkaline gel. And again, it's um, slightly running ahead of the uh, slightly ahead of the S on the acid gel as well. So quickly looking at it, you think, yeah, it's running with the S, but it's uh, it's obvious that it isn't. And being sickle cell negative, we knew it wasn't a sickle. So um, we sent if, um, next slide, please. So we sent a sample um, and chromatograms to Tozo at the time, who were always interested in. Um, looking at these, um, these unusual variants. And they confirmed that um, uh, it was a novel hemoglobin variant. So our consultant hematologist contacted the GP to ask if the patient would consent for DNA testing. Um, the patient con uh, consented and was, uh, was apparently very interested in, in it. So the sample was sent off um, and found to be heterozygous um, for a beta a beta globin gene mutation at code on 79. That's an aspartate to an aniline. So we was asked um, what we wanted to call it. And um, obviously we called it in Torbay Hospital, we called it hemoglobin Torbay. Uh, I understand the patient was very disappointed because uh, he wanted it to be named after him. But uh, unlike bacteria, the, the var hemoglobin variants are named after the place they're found in as opposed to the person they're found in. Uh, so next slide, please. Right, so this is just a report from the from Oxford, um, the hemoglobinopathy um, screening centre, just confirming that uh, it, it is a novel variant and uh, the variant is now on the register as hemoglobin torbay. So it puts us on the map a bit, being a small, not bad for a small DDH, well, a medium-sized DDH, really. G yeah, GDH, sorry. Um, next, next slide, please. Right, so we, um, um, one of our other consultants um, and actually um, put a, a poster together, which we, which was presented at the ISLH. And uh, a lot of this uh, work was done also as a project from one of our trainee um, BMSs in, in her registration portfolio. Um, so we've got her to thank and um, our consultant to thank for putting this poster together with all the data. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of discussions, I mean, the, the numbers that we, um, we see are very, very low and 0.06% of the A1C tests um, conducted in those two years were found to have a variant. Um, and only 0.06% a 1% um, total number of the A1C tests were basically uh, had any clinical significance if, if they were found in um, a homozygous form, that would be. Um, we're actually um, finding we're picking up even more now because we've moved over to a capillary electrophoresis as opposed to HPLC. We're actually picking up um, more variants, so it'd be interesting to do the study in another couple of years. So in 2016, the A1C um, analysis at Torbay Hospital cost approximately £43,000 compared to approximately 34 in 2014. Um, the exponential growth of using A1Cs uh, as a screening tool as well as um, uh, a tool to monitor diabetes has had a great impact in terms of the workload of biochemistry and therefore picking up the um, uh, hence they're uh, picking up extra variants for us to look at. 
obviously, and there's arguments against this, ethical implications. Um, I remember at the Tozo meeting, um, probably about 50% of the room um, uh, felt that it wasn't um, right to actually carry on to go on, go on and screen. Uh, another 50% said um, that that's what they do and that's their practice. Our consultant haematologist, um, he's very uh, much in favour of us screening for HBRC and gels, but feels that the obviously if we need to go any further with DNA analysis, that's when we need patient consent. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's open for discussion really, um, which, is, uh, which is the right way to go. Um, certainly it provides an interest in, for the lab to pick up these variants and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's quite, uh, if you do pick up a new one, it gives you quite a buzz really. <clears throat> also there's um, problems with clinician awareness. If they get a report stating the patient's got a variant and all they've asked for is an A1C, um, that can cause some concern or, or misunderstanding. Um, but fortunately, with our, our hematologist always tends to put a comment on to say either is or, or not clinically significant. We tend to put, add a comment to say it's been detected um, during A1C analysis. So it's, it's very clear for the clinician why, why we've done it and why they've got that result. Um, next slide, please. So, um, for, for this part, yeah, um, I'd like to acknowledge um, obviously Tozo for doing a lot of the legwork for us. Sean Cook, who was one of our BMS fives at the time, and Dr. Patrick Roberts and Dr. Dave Tucker for um, for their medical input. Um, the next uh, couple of slides is case studies that we found out we um, came to our attention a couple of years ago, in the last two years. Uh, uh, if you go for the next slide, please. So case study one, um, this is a variant detected again by A1C analysis uh, on the G11. Um, so the patient history, the patient had been under a hematologist for PRV, um, uh, which actually JAK2 negative polycythemia. Although it's um, microcytic hyperchromia, that was generally due to the uh, um, persistent venous section that the patient had to um, encounter to control their polycythemia. Um, next slide, please. So uh, these are the um, uh, indices. They, they, as I said, they, they are microcytic hyperchromic, but that's partially due to the um, continued venous section. Uh, next slide. Right. So chemistry um, found this uh, um, variant with us uh, for us, and uh, when they're doing routine testing for A1C analysis as a screen. And obviously you can see there the two peaks um, as, as a variant is present. So we ran it on the G8, uh, Tozo G8. And next slide please. And we had a fast eluting band um, just coming off eluting before the hemoglobin A which looking at, um, we have had a hazard a guess to say that's probably a hemoglobin J. However, when we ran it on the gel, in the next slide, we had quite an unusual pattern. Um, the actual variant ran with the A on alkaline and separates on the acid, that's quite unusual. Um, most variants such as Ds, Gs, Js, etc., separate on the alkaline and run with the A on the acid. So, that, that in itself was uh, was interesting, um, and as you see on the on the acid, it runs in between the A and the F. So next slide. So we report it as um, uh, our consultant reports it as an unusual variant, um, and the patient has JAK2 negative polycythemia, therefore maybe a high affinity hemoglobin present. So we sent it off to our reference lab. Um, next slide. And they found a, a beta chain variant, which was um, uh, which which was previously discovered. Um, it's a mutation that code on 143, and um, given the name hemoglobin little rock. And that, in actual fact, was a high affinity uh, hemoglobin variant, which would um, 
obviously be the reason for the polycythemia. Um, also, with the actual mutation, the site of the mutation, the amino acid that's uh, substituted is a, a, 2P, a 2,3-DPG binding site, which makes sense because um, lack of 2,3-DPG um, uh, binding in the hemoglobin results in a high affinity hemoglobin. So it all, all fell into place, really. Uh, next slide, please. Case study two, this is um, a referral sample which we received from Royal Cornwall Hospital, antenatal screening. Um, both um, the woman and the biological father was for, were from Bulgaria. Normal um, uh, full blood count results. Um, so we did uh, HPLC. Um, so next slide, please. So we got a, a very nice peak on the yes, uh, in the yes window on the HPLC. Um, however, the sickle screen was negative. But at this time, we was actually um, running in parallel with the capillary electrophoresis, the Cedia, um, capillary uh, Terra 3. And so we also ran it on that. Next slide, please. And on that, we have a peak running where the A2 runs, at quite a significant uh, level, 40%. So obviously, we knew it wasn't an S, sickle screen was negative. The capillary electrophoresis obviously proves it, um, uh, confirmed it wasn't an S, an, a, a hemoglobin S. So um, obviously, we did gels. Next slide, please. And we had. Um, a, um, a band running very close to the hemoglobin C and a band running be around about the near the S window. So um, obviously looking through the papers, etc., and the, the library on the Cedia, which is um, a very, they've got a very good library on the for phresis and with the patterns and the three, uh, the three methods that we used, the, the actual result, next next slide please, was a probable hemoglobin O Arab. And despite the fact I'd um, trained and worked in London for many years, this is the first one I'd seen. And it happened to be a sample that came from Cornwall. So um, obviously, um, uh, as a result, we, we obviously needed uh, the, to screen the biological father um, who, wasn't, who, was negative, who was normal. So next slide please. That might be it. Yes, yeah, thank you very much. So um, happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, th thank you for that, David. You, just to remind us, everybody, if you have got questions, if you could please use uh, the questions box on the webinar. But uh, a couple of questions have already come in. Um, uh, one is, how did you find the change? You mentioned about changing methodology from HPLC to capillary electrophoresis. How did you find that? Uh, Is capillary more sensitive or? I'm really impressed with the um, capillary, the capillary electrophoresis. Um, the uh, electrophoresiograms uh, are a lot cleaner and um, the library, you hover over the peak and get a, a list of possible variants that uh, that you, you um, that it could be. And also it gives a very, very good indication whether it's an alpha or a beta variant as well, which is also useful. So we can now more or less differentiate between D's and G's. Yeah. So do, do, it, do you find it's more efficient with capillary electrophoresis than HPLC? Does it cut a lot of extra work out? Um, it's about the same amount of work. It's a bit more fiddly in terms. I know our biochemists um, who you primarily use it for an A1Cs and curse it because of it. It's a little bit more, um, <laughs> a bit more. Uh, work labor intensive, I guess, and uh, yeah. uh, but uh, in terms of uh, certainly what the results it gives us, we're very pleased with it. Uh, the, the increase in detection of hemoglobin variants, do, do you think that is countrywide? It's obviously not just a, just your population that's seeing this, is that is this generalist the viewpoint that people are seeing? And, and if so, do you think uh, a review needs to be undertaken of the sickle cell and thalassemia screening program, particularly with I, the uh, prevalent sites? I, I think it's, uh, it is countrywide. I mean, I've talked to a lot of my ex-colleagues. One of them is in the reference lab in Sheffield. 
and they've picked up several brand new variants from uh, A1C screening. Um, and so, um, and and also, yes, I think I think the screening program uh, I understand from um, Cedia are looking into whether we should be changing the algorithms, maybe, or or screening a bit more because obviously most of those variants weren't clinically significant, but we we yeah. seem to have quite a few Ds. And obviously, D is one of the hemoglobins that uh, is mandatory to pick up in the screening program. So, so, so you don't think you don't just think it's the the more you look, the more you find. Well, yeah, there there is there obviously is that, but obviously the more you look, the more you find. So, in the antenatal screening population, how many of them are are these, and how many of them are likely to, you know, um, should we be picking up? I don't know. It's a I mean, I'm, I'm sure Sevia would love us to screen everything because it'd be more yeah. more money for them. Um, but uh, it's in real terms, it's very low, very low, low numbers still, I guess. So uh, I, I understand it's something the screening program is looking at. Uh, and, and because we you're sort of using it, the, the hemoglobin A1C is a bit of a screening step prior to picking these up. Should there be a change in in the way A1Cs are used? That could have quite a big impact on the number of these these uh, novel hemoglobin variants that you pick up, or for that matter, any hemoglobin variant. You, you mean? Um, can you rephrase that? The, the, Sorry, the way yeah. A1Cs yeah. are used. Or? Should should the A1C should the number of A1Cs decrease? Then you obviously you're going to detect less and less of these, aren't you? So you're almost reliant on the A1C, uh, the the request for an A1C to be able to look at these things. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. I mean, I guess I mean most of them are, are clinically insignificant or heterozygous. So in terms of patient, um, you know, outcome for the patient, it wouldn't make any difference if they're missed. Um, but the the chemists actually. The chemists like to under, like to know what they are because they want to yeah. know whether it interferes with A1C testing. So that's that's the reason why they're very keen to know. We're keen to know from a hematologist interest point of view mainly. Yeah, I guess. And occasionally, you know, the chance of picking up a brand new variant. So, um, what you know against. So what will you call the next new one? You've already gone for hemoglobin Torbay. What will the next new hemoglobin be called? Well, I don't know. It depends, I guess. <laughs> we've got Payton, we've got, you know, <laughs> Newton Abbott, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, top less. So top uh, less, yeah. that, that, that's great. Thank you, David. We've had a, a question come in. And I suspect it's from a Welsh rugby supporter, but I could be wrong. <laughs> uh, very interesting presentation. Thank you, David. Do you think Eddie Jones should step down now or after the World Cup? <laughs> that's a very good question. Uh, what do you reckon, Andy? I mean, um, I think he's losing well, his way a bit at the moment. But uh, I, I think we'll, we'll I think we'll leave this for another day and a pint of bitter. Yeah, yeah. We'll peak at the World Cup again, like we did last time. <laughs> that goes without saying, so we're not going to say it. But no, that's great. Thank you very much, David. That's wonderful. Okay, cheers. Thanks. So, uh,